I ask you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And I'll get to it uh, much later. Galatians chapter 2. Now, let me, let me start off with, um, with this story. There's this, uh, in, in, during World War II, there was this, uh, this naval transport uh, vessel that was, uh, that was sailing across the seas, and, and it got bombed by a German submarine. And the submarine, or excuse me, the, the ship started to sink. And as, as it was sinking, um, the, the, uh, the, the officers and all the, all the crew members on board the ship started to scramble and panic. And, and there's this, um, this chaos on, on, on the ship. And, and in the midst of all this, this pandemonium, four chaplains stepped up and started handing out uh, life vests to all of the uh, all the crew members to to try to calm all the frightened men down. One was a Jewish rabbi, another one was a uh, Methodist, uh, another was a Roman Catholic priest, and uh, and another was a, a Dutch Reformed minister. And so, as they're distributing all these vests, and as these men are making their way to uh, to their uh, escape boats they started to realize they were running out of, uh, out of these vests. There are, I believe it was 902 servicemen that were on this boat, on this ship, and they started running out of, uh, out of life vests. So what, what these chaplains do, they start taking off their coats and handing it over to, uh, to these men. And they kept uh, giving as much as they could over to these men to save every single one of them. One survivor would later say, say this of the, of the men as they saw them kind of clutching uh, one another's arms uh, against, against the sinking ship. And he said, it was the finest thing I have seen or hope to see this side of heaven. The sacrifice of these four men would be recognized um, by Congress later on with the Medal of Honor of Hero- Heroism. They, they awarded, they conferred this um, this medal, uh, you know, after their death, and and as a, uh, and of of that um, of the 902 men that were on board, only 230 survived, and a lot of it was because of these four chaplains. Now I ask you, we talk a lot about dying to ourselves, dying to ourselves. We think we think dying to ourselves always. It always seems to be in the context of us giving up something that, that, is, uh, that is really for our own benefit. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to give up. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to sacrifice uh, you know, this, this addiction. I'm going to sa- uh, sacrifice this, these things that are in my life that, that occupy my attention. But what, what I see in, in the life of Jesus, what I see in Scripture, what I see, everything that is written about dying to ourselves... Is, is way more than just us giving up something, right? It's way more than that. When we say, well, I'm going I'm to sacrifice, I'm going I'm to die to myself, I'm going to die to that old self, uh, the, the one that, that, uh, that binged on Netflix, that, uh, the one that, uh, that spent all this time uh, playing video games, I'm going to die to myself. No, 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 no. This is, is an example of dying to ourselves. Dying to ourselves ought to be in such a way where a part of us dies so that we can serve another person. A part of us dies so that we can build somebody up. This is what true dying to ourselves mean. When we look at uh, this, and I'm just going to go uh, in brief over all the, uh, the different events that took place on this, on this Sunday, this uh, Resurrection Sunday. We know it to be about uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the resurrection uh, of Jesus, the empty tomb and all that, but it's, uh, it's so much more than that. It's so much more. There's a lot of events that took place, and, when, uh, and if you've been following my live stream, I've gone over uh, 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 some of the events that took place on, on this day. Uh, when you bring all the Gospels together, what we call the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you line these details, these narratives side by side with what happened on this day after Sabbath, we, we see this. Number one, we, we, uh, there's, there's basically, in a sense, four different acts that take place here. Scene one is 
this discovery uh, at the tomb. We, we, uh, we read in Matthew that the tomb was found empty, but uh, there are events that led up to that. There was an earthquake, right? Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. I could, uh, you know, I, I, went to, I went to UC Davis. I studied uh, aeronautical and mechanical engineering. And, I, and when, I, when I read a passage like this, I'm thinking, okay, there was an earthquake. There must have been a big boom of, of some sort. This angel must have been flying so fast down, he broke the sound barrier, and then boom. And then, uh, and was, I mean, do, do you not see that? I mean, the angel of the Lord came down, and, and he, he uh, broke the sound barrier probably multiple times, and then came and rolled the stone away, and then sat on top of it, right? And, uh, and this is all before all these ladies came out to prepare the body of Jesus. Then we see scene two. There's, there's, this, there's a lot of running around that takes place. Uh, once, uh, according to John's account, you see Mary Magdalene, who's, who's the only woman that's mentioned in, in John's account. Mary Magdalene sees the empty tomb, runs uh, over to uh, inform the disciples, right? And then uh, the, the disciples don't, uh, don't believe what they're hearing, and Peter and Paul run back to, to the tomb. John chapter 20, verse 2. So she ran. This is Mary Magdalene. So she ran, went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the, the one whom Jesus loved. John is speaking of himself. And said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And so you, you have um, this running back and forth. And then at the same time, according to... Matthew's account, the, the, the other ladies, they, they uh, probably didn't respond as quickly. They, they saw the angel of the Lord, whether, whether there's one angel that was sitting outside on top of the stone, whether in Mark's account, uh, they went inside the tomb and saw one angel there, or in Luke's account, they saw two angels there. There's a, there's a lot of discrepancies, but the, this is not the focus here. The women came and, and encountered these supernatural beings and we're told that Jesus is not here. They were then told to go and, and inform the disciples. So they start making their way over to see the disciples. Then we see the third scene. Now we start to see Jesus appearing to all these different people. It's not just one appearance. It's multiple appearances. Right? It starts off in, in Mark chapter uh, 16, verse 9. Mark would uh, include this and say, when he, arose, uh, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from, from whom he had cast out seven demons. We combine this with what we read in, in John's account. And, and, and so you have uh, Peter and, uh, and John running back to the tomb. They uh, look inside. They see uh, the tomb is indeed empty. They start making their way back. Uh, Mary Magdalene must have followed them back to the tomb. And, and here she is. She's crying at the, at the entrance of the tomb. And that's when, uh, when Jesus appear, first appears to her. Of all the people in all of Scripture, Jesus would appear before a woman. And it's significant for that time because a woman at that time, uh, her, her testimony is only worth half of that of a man. But for Jesus to come and, and, and say, I'm, of all people, I'm going to uh, reveal my, my, my resurrected self before her first. It's, it's quite profound. And so he, uh, he has this intimate dialogue with her and says, you know, uh, I, I know who you're looking for, and I'm, I'm here. And, and then later, another significant moment, we see that Jesus appears to the other women. Matthew chapter 28, verse 9. And behold, Jesus met them. These are the women, the other women that were making their way from, again, this is my assessment of how all these events unfolded. He met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his, of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Wow. 
first to Mary Magdalene, then to the other women. And then, who do you think he's going to appear to next? Not the, the, not the 12 disciples, not the 11 disciples, excuse me, but to two other uh, disciples that are further, uh, further removed from, from the core 11. These are two men that were walking on this road to Emmaus, uh, out to this countryside, and they're having this conversation. In, in Luke's account, it goes into uh, greater detail, but Mark chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. After these things, he appeared in uh, another form to, to two of them as they were walking into the country, and they went back and told the rest, and they did not believe them. You have these two men. One, one's name is uh, Clopas. The other one, uh, we don't know his name, but uh, they're, they're making their way to Emmaus. They're, they're having this conversation. They're, they're probably uh, looking at each other like, can you believe all of this, these things have happened? That Jesus is no longer with us. And, and then Jesus is walking alongside them, and, he, and, and they didn't even recognize him at first. And they start to, uh, start to have this conversation. And Jesus asks them, what are you guys talking about? And, and Jesus is, is kind of playing it off like, I, I want to know what you guys are talking about. And then the moment they came to recognize it was Jesus was the moment they broke the bread, right? If you look at Luke's account, the Luke chapter 24, they broke bread with him. And I mean, they encouraged him to stick around and, and they had this uh, meal together. And when the moment they broke bread, they realized who they were talking to. It's Jesus. And then right at that moment, he disappears from their presence. And they're like amazed. And, and they, they're talking to each other and they were saying, you know, our, our hearts are on fire because of, because of what we just experienced. We got to go in and, and, and tell the, the other disciples. And then, and then, we see Jesus now appearing to the 10 disciples here. Why do I say 10? Because the next night, Thomas would then join later. But just the 10. Verse 36 of Luke chapter 24 and as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. Now, remember, this is, they're in this one room, probably uh, up in, in the same upper room where they, uh, uh, they had that last supper with, with Jesus. And the doors are locked. They're hiding out from everybody. And now out of, out of, this, out of the corner of the room steps Jesus. And, and, and he says, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you doubt? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, they still disbelieved, uh, and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything to eat here? And they gave him fish, a uh, piece of broiled fish, and, they, and he took it and ate it before them. What a powerful encounter. What a powerful encounter. You have uh, all these people coming to see the resurrected form of Jesus, Right? This is not a spirit. This is, this is him in, the, in flesh and blood, uh, the, the very flesh that, that was crucified on the cross. And he says to them, look, look, at the, look at my wounds. It's me. How many of us here desire to see Jesus? I really hope we do, right? I mean, here's the thing. Here, here's, here's my, I actually, I haven't done this in a while, but I actually have multiple points, Okay. I, I, I've always been uh, trying to stay focused, but uh, just do one point, a one-point sermon. But that's been such a challenge. Today, I'm going to do two points. <laughs> First point, Jesus will reveal himself to those who are seeking him. This is a guarantee. I, I guarantee you that if, you have, if your heart is really seeking after Jesus, he will reveal himself. Jesus is not one who says, you know what, I, I'm going I'm to play hide and seek with you, right? I'm gonna, I'm, you, you have to come and find me. I'm hiding in a very, very, uh, very, uh, uh, very secretive place. And, and No, Jesus is one who's basically saying, I want my people to know 
You know, if, if, we, if our heart is, is burning like the, the, the two men that were walking on this road to Emmaus and they're, 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 their hearts and their minds are just like, just, uh, just replaying everything that has gone on in Jerusalem and they're asking themselves, what, what's going on? And they're in, in the heart of hearts, they really wanted to see Jesus. Jesus is going to reveal himself to those who are seeking. If we're not seeking, if we're not asking ourselves, what, uh, how do I hear from Jesus? If we're not even asking that question, he is not going to entertain you unless he wants to. But there is a guarantee if you are truly seeking after him, he will be found. He will be found. We see that in, in, in Scripture. Uh, he would spend 40 days and, and, and be amongst the people that, that, were, uh, that were seeking after them and desiring to, to connect, reconnect with him. Because everything erupt, uh, ended so abruptly. They had, they, Jesus was like violently torn from their, uh, from their presence. And then they, they saw him crucified and beaten and scourged and on, on all these different things. And, and it, was, it was a very sudden and violent ex, uh, experience. They wanted closure with that. And here Jesus comes back into their lives and says, not only am I going to give you closure, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you joy that this, this world cannot uh, understand. I'm going to give you power because now I'm going to impart the Holy Spirit that I've been talking about. And he's saying, I'm going to give all this to you because I love you. My second point is this. The gospel lifestyle includes the cross in our lives. I think so many times when we look, at, look upon this, this gospel message, you know, so yesterday we had such a great time uh, with Easter Fun Fair. I, I, I don't know if you saw, I, I, I recreated the tomb of Jesus. I mean, it, was, it, was, um, it was such an honor you know, uh, building a tomb for Jesus. And uh, I felt like Joseph of Arimathea. It's like, yes, jo Jesus, please occupy. Oh, shoot, he's not in here. But that's part of the act, right? Because I'm, uh, as the kids were going inside, you know, um, uh, one, of, one of the guys from the well, he's like, he's like, he's super massive. And he was perfect for the role of, of this uh, Roman centurion. And yeah, Michael, he, he was great. And, and, and there's, you got this, but he was, he was smiling he had this big smile on him. He's a massive guy, but he's had this big smile on him, and, and all the kids were coming up, and, and they were like actually pushing him and everything, and they were grabbing his sword. But they, they, got, into, uh, they got into the tomb, right? And, and, and I love the, the setup. Uh, uh, the centurion was saying, to him, okay, I'll, I'll let you go inside. I won't, uh, you don't tell anybody. I'm going to let you go inside. And then as he walked inside, he, he asked them, did you find Jesus? You know, and of course, this is kind of the setup. The, the kids go inside and they, they look around, and you got this um, this uh, black light shining down on this uh, this white linen on, uh, that's laid on this shelf, and uh, and it's like it's glowing. And the kids walk in, and, and they're they're like uh, ruffling it up, and, and then as they're coming out, and I, I, uh, Gabby and I would ask them, "Did you find Jesus?" And, and that's kind of a, a dumb question because the answers are written all over the wall, right? And, and I asked, "Did you find Jesus?" No. Wait, where's Jesus? Because uh, if we don't know where Jesus is at, that centurion is going to lose his job. He's going to lose his head. He's going to lose his family and everything. We got we to help, help, help this guy out. And they, they were like, but Jesus is not there. Where is he? And then a lot of these kids were just like, point straight up. And, I, and there's a part of me that I just wanted to cry like, you guys get it. Yes. Right? That's, that's the power of the tomb here. No, it's, 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 it's the gospel, right? They understood the gospel. They're coming out, and I asked them, do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is alive? Do you believe that Jesus is not going to be found in a tomb? And they were like, yes. And then Gabby and I would be dancing like, yay, Jesus is alive. Now go tell everybody. Go tell everybody, right? And we were doing I mean, the kids, were, I mean, I, there was one kid that just like ran off, and I'm like, oh, I, Oh man, I, I hope I hope the kid knows where he's going because he left the pa parents behind. But but here the, the the kids were getting this message that Jesus is alive. He's not going to be found in a tomb. That that this is such good news. It's got to be shared. And a lot of times when we look upon this message, we jump from uh, in the gospel. We, we jump right to the eternal life portion, right? 
We just say, yes, yes, I, I believe in Jesus. I, I want that eternal life. And, I, and that's, that's what I want. I, I believe in Jesus. I got eternal life, right? We skip the part about being crucified with Jesus. We skip the part about, you know, how we're supposed to be like Jesus. Now, let's, let's take a look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. What do we see? Verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, we... This, this gospel message is not about... I mean, it's... It, it, there is this component about eternal life. This, there is this uh, the component about this power that is found in, in, in this faith with Jesus. But it cannot skip the part about us being crucified with Christ. This is the, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia. And he's, he's uh, encouraging them and building them up. And, and in this part, he gives them this, this part of his heart. It reveals part of his heart to, to these people. And it basically says, I have been crucified with Christ. You look at the life of these disciples, and they have basically embraced the fact that I am going to die to myself completely, and I'm going to give myself to the church, to building up of the church. So if any of us here ever want to say, I'm going to die to myself, I'm going to be crucified with Christ, it ought to be more than just, I'm dying to my old habits. I'm dying to my old ways. I'm dying to, my, uh, to, to that dark self. It's got to be including the church in it. It's got to be where, you know, I'm going to die to myself such that I'm, I'm, that new part that comes out in me is going to be like our Lord Jesus Christ, who washes the disciples' feet, who goes from town to town and teaches about the kingdom of God that is coming. He's going to go and, and serve all these different people, heal them and, and, and restore them back into worship, right? If you truly want to die to ourselves, we need to turn it around and say, you know what, I'm going to die to that old self, that selfish part of me, and turn it around and say, I am going to commit my life to helping this brother restore his relationship with, with the one true God. I'm going to dedicate myself to, to spending time with these children so that they have an opportunity to come to know Jesus. I'm going to dedicate myself to, to going into my small group, uh, being prepared and really sharing and, and building one another up because someone else in here lacks that faith and, and my faith is going to be such that they can, they can borrow it and they can walk their way to Jesus until one day they have their own faith in Jesus. That's what truly dying to ourselves look like. Look, dying, dying to ourselves is, isn't about, you know what, I'm, I'm going uh, to give up uh, this, this pursuit for a promotion. I'm going to give up this pr pr uh, pursuit for a promotion uh, so that I can make more money, so that I can one day perhaps give it, uh, give it back to the church. Give that up. But instead, look at it from... The life of Jesus. This, this whole week was about how much of a sacrifice Jesus gave for each and every one of us. Culminating into this life that he says, now I give it to you. Now, and, and then Ma Matthew 28, what does he do to, to the disciples? He gathers them up uh, at, at, the, at, at this hill in, in Galilee and, he, and the, at the, the appointed place. And he says to them, okay, guys... Now I send you out. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have taught you. And keep doing this until the end of the days. I will be with you. He sends them out because he knows that they are ready to die to themselves and give their lives over to the church to fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, to be able to say, I, 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 the life I lived, no longer my own. The life I now live, 
is for the, for the purpose of building one another up. Do you see that theme in all of Scripture now? Ephesians speak of that. Whether it's in the context of the church, whether it's in the context of marriage, in the con- context of parenting, whatever it may be, we're going to die to ourselves so that we can build one another up. Husband and wives, we've we got to look at each other and say, you know what, I'm going to die to myself so I can build my spouse up. In the context of, of, of friendship, I'm going to die to myself so I can build somebody up. In the context of serving, I'm going to die to myself when I come up here, when I, when I lead this time of worship, I'm going to die to myself because I don't want people to see me anymore. I want them to see Jesus being lived out through me because I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is the life that Christ now gives to us. His resurrection tells the world, signals to the world, watch out. Here comes my people. Here comes the church. World, are you ready for this? Are you ready for for the love that's going to just spread across this land? It's coming. And we are part of that wave. Here's my challenge to each and every one of you. Die to yourself for the purpose of loving others. Die to yourself for the purpose of loving others. Don't just die to yourself for yourself. Not enough. If Jesus did that, this would be a whole different gospel. But what he did was, was level two, level, it was literally God level, right? In video game terms, right? God mode. Let's, let's live our lives such that, you know, when we go from here, it is truly to, uh, to love others, right? You start, right now, I really believe all of us are starting to hear these verses echo in our hearts and our heads right now. The verses that we've read, right? Just close your eyes for a moment. Just close your eyes for a moment. In that upper room, do you remember what Jesus said to to the disciples? John chapter 13. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another. He is speaking that to each and every one of us right here, right now. Our Lord Jesus Christ whom we worship. He is right here right now. He is calling each and every one of us. Regardless of our, of our walk with the Lord, He is calling us to love one another. And again, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, let's pray how we can take our walk to be like Jesus, to die to ourselves, so that we can love others. What's it going to take? What's it going to take for us to live a life that mirrors that of Jesus? Is it, is it going to be repentance? Maybe some of us need to repent of our sinful ways. Because we've been living in those, in those manners that, that really displeases God. We've compromised. We've compromised to such a degree that we've, we've justified our, our sinful actions, our sinful ways. Maybe it requires repentance right now. Maybe for some of us, actually I know there are some of us here that are struggling with that heart to love others. Lord, I don't have that heart. I don't have that heart capacity. I've been hurt so many times. I've been just beaten down by the world. I don't have anything left. Well, that's where we need to pray that the power of our Lord Jesus Christ comes into our lives. That we don't love on our own effort. But we love with the power that is found in Christ Jesus. Maybe there's pride. There's pride here right now. There's anger. We got to let that go. There's fear. There's arrogance. All these things come in the way 
of us dying to ourselves to be able to love others. Let's just take um, 30 seconds again, just, just to pray for ourselves. How can we break free so that we can die to ourselves to love others? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Thank you so much for the love that is demonstrated, not only upon the cross, the sacrifice that you, your Son gave for each and every one of us, but for, for also, Lord, the empty tomb and how you invite us into this, this space to discover you, Lord Father God. Father, it is you that, uh, that calls us into this relationship. Lord, it is you that reveals your, your son to each and every one of us, Lord Father God. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you set us free, Lord Father God. You take every single shackle that, it, that holds us down, Lord Father God. All the pain, all the heartache, all the burdens, all the uh, worries and concerns, Lord Father God. I pray in the name of Jesus that all these things have no hold upon us anymore. Father, I pray that you just uh, release us, Lord Father God release us so that we can truly be not only your vessels in your hands, Lord Father God, but be powerful, powerful witnesses in your kingdom, Lord Father God, to tell the world, to remind the world that our Lord Jesus Christ is alive. And Father, I pray that if there is any darkness in our hearts, Lord Father God, may your light shine down upon it and just drive it out. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you cast out every single demon that is in our homes, in our hearts, Lord, that they have no place in here. Father, that they flee at the sound of your name, Lord Father God. And we declare that over our lives. We declare that over each and every one of us, Lord Father God. Father, we are stronger together. We are powerful in your presence. Lord Father God, and we have no fear, Father God, because you are going to be doing a mighty and powerful thing in this place, Lord Father God. Lord, I pray that the worship that takes place here is not one that this world has ever heard, Lord Father God. Lord, it is a worship that glorifies the King, the King that reigns supreme, the King that is going to reign mightily over all the earth, Lord Father God, and that King will be returning one day to claim everything that is his, Lord, and I pray that you will just release us, Lord, Father God, release us so that we can just worship you unhindered, unfettered, and without any worries and concerns, Lord, Father God, because you deserve the best. You deserve the everything from us, Lord, Father God. And so, Father, right now, as we worship you, Father, I pray that nothing is held back, Lord, Father God, that it is all for you. We love you, Lord. We give you thanks, and we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.